Sweet eternal balance of all that is good, true, and beautiful, friends. What a super fantastic treat we've got for all the Rogue Warriors tonight as we return to a deep dive into what Chance Garden calls Darkotypes, the inverted archetypes of the traditional tarot as found in Cyberpunk 2077, which he became fascinated with and analyzed intensely, inviting me along the journey. We started this exploration on Chance's show, Interverse, and we are here to conclude it tonight. Chance's podcast, Interverse, is so very Rogian that I'm surprised we didn't collide sooner, but I'm so grateful to find another soul of depth, integrity, genuine curiosity, humility, and a heart bigger than the cosmos, the connector, the I Ching scryer, the badass, the one and only Chance Garden is here tonight, and we couldn't be happier. Chance, welcome to Rogue Ways. It is so good to have you. How are you doing? I'm pretty jazzed up. I've never had someone turn the tables on me and do... And a pump up intro like that. That's one <laughs> yeah, thing that we have it. in common. I was inspired by Greg at the higher side chats to pre-write intros. And, you and me both. <laughs> I did an episode <laughs> where I got accused of being a THC ripoff and I was like, cool. I'm good. Fine. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's great. Awesome. I know. I've I'm excited. The same. Your show rocks, Someone... by the way. I just got to say, Thank I've been you. getting into it since we connected and I would say the other way around rogue rogue ways couldn't be more interversey. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's very, we're very similar and we have very similar shows and it's awesome, but they're very different too. I mean, there's always like a style and a flair that's unique to the, to the host, but like the topics and the things we're interested in, like the way we think about things, I think is very, very aligned. So I know every, every rogue warrior out there is going to want to go check out Interverse if they haven't already. Cause I was, you know, telling them about this previous deep dive into this archetypal tarot that we did before. And so I hope some of them already found that or already knew you and uh, were stoked about it. But I do want to um, say before we get started that I have very exciting news that I've been invited to be on Rockfin Network. And I'm super stoked. It's R-O-K-F-I-N for people who aren't subscribed yet. The thing that I'm the most pumped about is not only that I get to reach um, you know, newer and audiences and get some support back from that, but I get to start a new show called Middle Path. And if you know me, you know the Middle Path is my jam. It's uh it's it's gonna be really cool. It's all about psycho spiritual, you know, path work and the actual practical things that we can do on an everyday uh way and the philosophy about it and uh, you know all the syncretic paths that we can take to these uh higher levels of being and more integrated levels of being. It's gonna be really, really cool. So I'm very excited. But the thing that's really cool is if you go to Rockfin, instead of paying like ten dollars for this podcast, five dollars for that one, seven dollars for this one, you get this bill racked up because you love podcasts as much as all of us do. Um, you get to pay just ten dollars a month and you get all of the content on Rockfin. So you get to support all of the people you love and get all of that content. You could listen to thousands of hours of podcasts a month or like five hours. You know, it's just totally up to you. So it's a really cool deal. I hope you guys go over to rockfin.com slash rogue ways and subscribe because I'm already there. Although the new show is not going to drop until this coming Thursday, which is super exciting. So that's my big news. Very excited. And don't worry, rogue ways isn't going anywhere. If you're in rogue.locals.com in the community, you're still going to get the exclusive rogue ways content and all of the, you know, content that's only there. That's still going to be true. That's still going to be our community hub. Rockfin is just another network and another show. And so I hope you guys go check it out. So, I got to say congrats about that real quick. That's a great you. move. I haven't <laughs> heard of Rockfin, but as someone that does my a subscriber content on Patreon, that makes me nervous. And to hear that there are solutions coming up that are podcaster oriented, I would think that that should probably include respect for everything a podcast might be about without the type of like Patreon actually took me out of their search feature one time. And I was like, that's, yeah, so you couldn't Even, find me on the page randomly, which, you know, that's no traffic, but I fought that. I think they got their ass kicked in some recent lawsuits, but good. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's part of why I went to subscribe stars because Patreon was, you know, practicing a lot of censorship like that. And then subscribe star took me out of their search results and they didn't even, they pretended like they hadn't done so. And I was like, this is shady. So you're even shadier than Patreon. So I still, you know, I have subscribers on subscribe star and that's cool. Locals is pretty cool. Cause you get the sort of chat and, you know, posting articles and posting like favorite recipes and, you know, that community aspect that you're not going to get other places. But I love that Rockfin is committed to being free of censorship. So is Locals, uh, if you want to go start a Locals community. Um, but but yeah, there's just so I many think I do. I, I need to diversify. I get yes. stuck in the rut of just making the show 
and uh, telling myself I'm doing enough, but there's always ways to expand it. The whole point is the tribe. So right. I've got a discord, but sounds like the locals thing might be even more well grounded, if you will. Yeah. Look, discord has been screwing some people over and practicing censorship too. <laughs> yeah, so it's well, like, it's called discord. So what do you think? Right. <laughs> <laughs> True. Uh, hopefully we have some of these that, that stay, you know, with their integrity and, you know, with, with, Rockfin and locals making it a point to be committed to that at least gives me some hope because other places were like, yeah, sure. Like come here. It's free. But they weren't like we promise. You know what I mean? There wasn't that intention set in the beginning. So I just I'm hoping that intention will like carry through so we can we can hope (laughs) Um, not to dodge the pointless question. But all this talk of justice (laughs) against the machine will segue nicely into card number 11, which is justice when we when we fire that up. That's true. Well, oh, oh, okay. We'll just do the pointless question of the episode anyway for, <laughs> I'm ready. for old time's sake. Dude, I've <laughs> been psyching you. myself up for it. Let's do yeah. it. <laughs> You've seen people be stumped by it, so you're ready. Um, we, I just am bombarded with cold weather, and I imagine a lot of other people are right now, too. So I just wanted to know what your favorite cold weather activities were. Favorite cold weather activities would be throwing pieces of snow at people. Breaking giant pieces of ice, stomping around, uh, just being goofy. I don't know. Other than that, I mean, sledding's awesome. What isn't your favorite activity in the snow? And being a grown-up, it's like, (laughs) when do you do that anymore? It's kind of, uh, yeah, I don't know. It's kind of lame. I haven't done that for a while. Last year, I had some good playing in the snow time, but it's just not been good enough here yet. Yeah. But that's a good question, because right now we're about to get a massive... Super end of the world blizzard. Everyone's going to die. The news is yeah. <laughs> scaring everybody's mom and dad pretty bad about it. <laughs> Mine they're included. Like, they're like, wear your hats. Just make sure to wear your hats. And I'm like, why are they so obsessed with hats? I mean, you should wear your hat. But like, are there people who don't wear their hats? But it's this cold. Like, it's just weird. Uh, the news is so weird. They're like, wear your dad or your uncle or something. And we're going to like tell you to wear mittens. And you're like, yeah, I think we know how to wear mittens now. Like. Yeah, they tell you to wear a lot of things Whatever. that are ridiculous, especially lately. Yeah, true. Like the lady I saw in a car with two masks on by herself, and I was like, man. Dude, it's insane. In a car by herself. You could see that it's there were two. They had different insane. designs on them. Oh, my God. <laughs> it's insane. And I'm like, even the even the two mask thing, I'm like, this is this is getting ridiculous. And people were joking about things, right? People were like, oh, yeah, sure. So we're like 10 masks then. And then like. Within a few months, they were like, you should wear two masks. And I'm like, no, but really think, wear two or three. I think they're taking our jokes and like the things that we're doing to like try and wake people up. And they're like, yeah, no, we're going to do that then. Because we were like, what if they told you to put, you know, this thing up your butt, your finger up your butt and walk around? It's like, well, we're not going to do that, but we are going to anal swab you for to test for this virus. And I'm like, they're serious. Like, we have to stop joking about this, you guys. <laughs> Whatever we joke about, they're going to make into reality. We just need to, like, back it up a little bit. But You blew my mind when you pointed out that butt stuff is a mind control tactic. And I was like, whoa, that makes total sense. But, yeah, yeah going in through the outdoor on a <laughs> yeah. meta- metaphysical <laughs> level is a, a real magical occult technique. So It is. And it's not just in magic and occult. It's in a lot of spiritual traditions that aren't. It's it's like kind of subtly in the tradition where there it's not I don't even know how to really explain it. It's like part of like um you'll like clench or you'll like do like Kegel like things during the exercise and it's the same concept that you're like activating. <laughs> you know, it's it's very interesting and it's very common actually once you start to look more deeply at a lot of these things and then you're like, wow, like but this takes a a, a knowledge of physiology you know, applied to uh, and combined with your sort of mental state and your emotional state, your visualization and all these things to create like a holistic thing. It's it's super fascinating. And there's actual materialist science to sort of back it up. So, yeah, it's weird, but it's true. And how I mean, they're doing the, it like openly. <laughs> you're forcing someone to dilate, literally. And that yeah. is a whole body experience. And then dilation leads to whatever energies around you spells signs uh rituals all gonna be taken in more fully and with less defenses yeah. but yeah we're weird times weird times weird times and well let's non-segue into <laughs> the first card the justice card um 
Do you want to take us away? You're like really, you're the one who's on top of all of this. Yeah. So like the first time around, I've got a slide that shows what the game's description of the card is. And I thought about it more. And I think that it is worth including because it points out the fact that what's being done here with like the, I've decided it's the archetypes are being reduced is like the best way to describe it. Reducing can mean a lot of things, but especially in the sense of the way these descriptions from the game are, you're reducing down to a one-dimensional interpretation of the archetype when anyone that's into tarot knows that there's like so many things that it could represent. It's all context-based, but in in this like sort of artificial future, I think the point is to create a circuitry with a predictable pathway in a sense. And so what they say about justice here is it is the card of conflict resolution. It proclaims the need for order to see through lies and deceit and a return to the natural state of affairs. Justice implies a just sentence, but also due process. Okay, well, look at that guy. Yeah. Do you see any due process happening there? I don't know. He looks like he probably just slice and dicey, right? He's like, I'll pick you up with my left arm and I'll cut you with my right arm. It's very balanced. (laughs) Yeah, as you can see, the scales are in there, which is perfect because it's a Libra correspondence traditionally and also fits for card number 11, having one and one together yeah. at that balance. The, uh, what's also interesting is we're in the same time of year as Scorpio, and there's a lot of uh, people that I respect, but I haven't done the same reading that they've done, that say that there was actually a 10 sign zodiac at one point and one sign was split into three. And the split happened in the Libra, Virgo, Scorpio area. And so having the, you can see the scorpion in the guy's back there. Yeah. So it's definitely accentuating the the, uh, death dealing aspect. Stinger horror, yeah. (laughs) (laughs) But let's uh, let's get your first impressions of this one. It is not super complex, but I think that where, where we'll really get some meat out of it is looking at what's not there from the original guy. It's interesting. Um, I, and I just have to say this really quick. Cause you know, uh, crow triple seven, he likes to point out that Libra is the one sign in the Zodiac that isn't like natural or an animal or whatever. Um, which I've always thought was interesting. And then I just was watching, I think it was good omens. Uh, and it said, you know, the earth is a Libra. And I was like, huh, interesting that'd be an interesting way to like put like why there was one that wasn't you know an animal or whatever is because it represents like an entire realm or something or like the whole planet and that was interesting to think about that you know this balance this idea of scales and balancing is very much of this world you know we're very dualistic uh and everything here is sort of separated out into those those these two two camps right yin or yang and one or the other one or zero on and on forever so i was like that's very interesting so i just speaking of libra wanted to throw that out just for fun um but yeah it is it is interesting to the sword right when the sword is up in the traditional card i feel like and it's very non-threatening right it's there as almost like a uh just representation of this like rational um you know, observation, like sort of detached and unbiased uh, represent like the sword energy is supposed to represent that in general. It also reflects the magician with the as above, so below. Oh yeah. Good call. The hands. Yeah. Um, And he over here in this other is like, he has one clenched fist and then the sword just kind of down and that downward uh, kind of um, stance that he has held in reminds me of like every movie you've ever seen where like when they're done cutting people apart, they're just kind of like hanging it there waiting to make sure everything's sort of over. So he's still like at the ready and he's already like dealt the justice that doesn't really seem like it would be just as you pointed out. He's like judge, jury and executioner here. It's not very objective or detached as it's supposed to be. <laughs> um, so that's yeah. interesting. Big time. Uh, but they do, they do still have the towers on each side, sort of in the background, but the towers are those, you know, wiry sort of like endless city instead of this um representation of sort of like tradition and structure and you know which we kind of rely on in a justice situation we're like okay this is the most fair that we've been able to come you know in our thousands of years of progression as humans and so we're gonna rely on this system even if it isn't always perfect or that's how we're supposed to look at it right um it doesn't really have that same energy in the other card the 
what it made me think of the fist part that you're pointing out is how in practices, Eastern movement practices like Qigong, Kung Fu, whenever you have a closed fist and it almost looks like his, I mean, it could be wrong about this, but you could almost interpret it as his thumb is in the fist instead of outside yeah. of it. And that yeah. represents like holding and building up a charge like Goku and Dragon Ball Z. And yeah. it's totally opposite. It reminds me again of the magician. I think there's a really big correspondence here between justice and the magician, the as above, so below of the original card. But then how in, if you remember back to the first round, the magician had his hands in his robe, possibly in a fist, yeah. like, uh, you know, directing the energy back into himself. And you could interpret yeah. the way the guy on the right looks as either being that it's all below. It's just, there's no above in this scenario, or it is uh, that he's not respecting the whole circuitry of heaven and earth. And instead he's just like making himself God in a yeah. sense, like you said, judge, jury and executioner, which fits really well with the, the artificiality of the scales. That's a really interesting point. Never heard the idea that the earth itself is a Libra, but the <laughs> planetary rulers here being Venus and moon well, there's a lot of contention that the moon's not natural, <laughs> that the True. moon's artificial. Yeah. And the Prometheus, Lucifer, dark aspe the dark aspect of the Venus archetype would be the artificer, the one that creates artificial things, artificial value systems. Wow. In the East, they consider the, I, I think, I could be totally misfielding this, but I think that there's, in some traditions, an idea that a Lucifer-like character uh, came to ancient China to basically teach people to use numbers for transactionality for mm -hmm. commerce, as opposed mm -hmm. to numbers all having only their spiritual archetypal meaning to people. And outside of, you know, basic figuring of how many chickens there are in front of you or whatever, not right. super important, but this is part of the mythic correspondence here of Maat, which is math. And what, one of the wow. biggest ways that society has moved into artificiality is to completely despiritualize number a hundred percent and make everything transactional. And that's like the dark justice, because whenever we live in a transactional society, uh, whenever we are give, we I think that we're giving something of equal value for what we're getting. There's an energetic canceling out that happens. There are indigenous cultures where it's taboo to give something equal value to what you receive. And that you always keep someone else in debt to you or stay in debt to someone else on, in a sense, but you don't look at it that way. You look at it like if you, if you gave me the exact reciprocity, same value of what I gave you, then it's like you're rejecting my gift because now you don't yeah. have anything more than you had before. And it's, it's stagnant. Exactly. It's stagnant. Yeah. It cancels this, the two towers. <laughs> it's yeah. It keeps us in polarity. And I think that's like the dark element of of justice if you will or of the scales is trying to make things balance out through a false value system instead of l letting nature show you how balance works which is that it's a big free flow of energy through an entire ecosystem where nobody keeps score and that uh, everybody rises together instead of everything that's done cancels itself out through transactionality and that type of thinking in that mind which is the commerce mind is basically we're at war with each other trying to make it look like we exchanged of equal value, but really seeing if we can get a little more than what we thought would be equal. So it's like, yeah. it's, it makes us all predatory in a lot of ways, even if we don't want to be like, and then I'll go ask people after explaining this very thing, Hey, sign up for my Patreon. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but it's well, like, we're, thing, we're forced to live this way in, right. inside of Babylon. And Yeah. Yeah. Well, and I, I totally feel that's such an awesome insight to share. And thank you so much for that. Cause I had never, you know, I've reflected and I think we even talked about it on the last episode of how words maybe were constructed as this artificial thing. And, you know, before that we could communicate much more directly and fully, and now we're reduced to just words. And it's sort of a similar idea, right? That the numbers were actually this misrepresentation almost, or like, too much of a representation which we became focused on exactitude you know and exactly this for this uh instead of just allowing things to sort of flow and sometimes be out of balance sometimes the scales are tipped you know and that's like a good thing because that's how energy moves um and you got to keep it sort of moving if you want 
you want things to keep moving. Uh, so it's an interesting trick that could be played to bring things to like more stagnation and more disconnection from what is the sort of true underlying reality. I love it. I mean, I don't love that, but I love <laughs> I love the insight. <laughs> well, it, and it's interesting because there isn't anything nature related to lose between one card to the other, unlike a lot of the other cards. True. So I th- Except- that's a big observation. There's this little bit of a hint of like a sun in the original justice card, right? It's not actually the sun, but it like hints at the sun. It's sort of like representing that mm-hmm. energy because your your crown, you know, your uh, enlightenment and your highest understanding is supposed to be brought to bear in a matter of justice. So when you're judging something external to you the best you can, you have to use your wisdom and, you know, your highest self over in the. Um, so it's not really nature, right? But it's like sort of alluding to that. And then over in the uh, reversal and the the dark version it's like a black sun because there's just that curve of like the um empty sky basically and so they've removed even the hint of what wasn't even natural but but could have made you think of natural sort of systems i'm glad you brought up the sun because it points to the time of year it looks like it's a setting sun the sun's going behind the curtain yeah and that's where we're at in the sky clock and that's a lot of what justice is really about or adjustment one of the alternate names for the card which is that at this time of year, you do need ma'at or math (laughs) in a way because what's coming is winter and you need to make sure that at this time in the harvest season and what's coming up to harvest that you calculate that your needs are going to be properly met before you go into the dark times. And that's what really, that's what it means about getting a balance with nature has to do with that, not to do with you know, transactionality like our entire court system and justice system is based on. But I'm impressed with this card. It had more to it than I thought once we got into it. (laughs) What do you think? Move on? Yes, let's do it. I think so. we got to charge forward. Oh, man. The Hanged Man, number 12. Uh (laughs) Uh, The Hanged Man is the card of sacrifice. It says that a price must be paid in order to achieve enlightenment. The hanged man's forsakenness opens the path for rebirth into a new life, though this path is wrought with pain and suspended in time and ultimately ends in death. It's like it wasn't wrong. You know, those those things are all like true. And then at the end, you're like, well, wow, that's that's the darkest take of it you could get. (laughs) Ultimately ends in death, which does. I mean, that is the next card. Yeah, true. (laughs) So I see where they're going with that. But now, yeah, we're fully into the Scorpio time of year. and. Man, I want to let you take a stab at this while I kind of absorb it. Uh, I've looked at these, but I've on purpose also tried not to like overly analyze them because I wanted this to be fresh. And yeah. I, I'm thinking yeah, some things, I've, definitely the Odin thing. I've that. De- yeah. Well, it's funny you say that because in my deck, it is Odin in this card, <laughs> um, which makes sense, right? Because Odin sacrificed himself to bring us uh, language and uh, rational thought and um, and those structures, which is also interesting to think about that, 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 that might've been like a trap or whatever, given what we've, we've mentioned, but the webbing is what instantly, uh, stands out to me, right? Because the, the hanged man, you know, I always, when it comes up in a reading, I'm always emphasizing that for, you know, we look at it sort of darkly in like, I guess, media and films, or, you know, when we see it, it just seems like bad, like, oh, the hanged man, like, I don't want to hang, like, what is this? Um, which is similar to the death card, right? But in reality, it's not a bad thing because it can just be this like time of pause and you're sort of being suspended, you know, it's, but it's, you look at him, he's fine. It's like, he's safely being suspended from this way. And it, and it might be a sacrifice and you might be like pausing and waiting and you might be giving something up, but at the same time, you're doing it for a specific reason, often for the sake of, of others around you. Uh, And there's, and that's a, a good, true and beautiful thing, you know? So this can be a really beautiful, you're, you're creating, um, the bridge, you know, and it kind of alluded to that in the little description too. But in this card here, it's like, I don't think he did this by choice. It looks like he was strung up and like trapped in this chaotic web. Um, So maybe the sacrifice is being like, uh, you know, put upon him rather than him giving this up. Well, you know, by choice, which is, it makes it like a dark ritual instead of a process that you undergo because you want to support others in the best way you can or yourself in the best way you can. And that this is just sort of the path you take, you know, and like, that's, that's again, like the darkest energy I think you could take from this 
um, set of ideas that go along with a hanged man. So, and all those people in the background are just adding to that, like, yeah, we strung you up because we needed you to sacrifice yourself. We don't really care what you want for yourself. Like, it's pretty um, disturbing, as as expected. <laughs> yeah, I mean, <laughs> this is the cyber tarot here, but I, I kind of think he might be the magician back from card one because he has this skull face thing. Yeah. Like maybe that's him with his face off. Like they caught him. He was dude. And what better sacrifice than someone with that much power? Exactly. (laughs) I do see that what you observed seems to be a big part of this message, which is that the, the uh, mythical hanged man does it for humanity by choice for themselves and uh, for humanity. The guy on the right, though, he's been strung up like he's been caught. You know, it's the I think it it demonstrates how crowd psychology, the collective, that's the uh, most. The thing that brings the most disillusion to a proper structure and order is crowd psychology, the delusion that you need to find a group to identify with. And do whatever they do. And then that's your route to safety or power or <clears throat> really the, ultimately it's your route to not taking responsibility for your own actions because you'd say, I didn't do it. This whole crowd did it. The group did it. I just or was going along with it. You're my students. You're like, well, why didn't they in trouble when they did it like last Wednesday? You're like, dude, come on. <laughs> <laughs> you're doing it right now. That's all that matters. <laughs> and it, it's interesting that, that it looks like spider webs. Um, Makes it feel more predatory for sure. I think that sort of highlights the the reading there. And I just keep thinking back to the Odin archetype and uh, how far away from like a noble and honorable warrior we seem to have come in what's considered the heroic masculine archetype. Mm-hmm. In I mean, to talk about archetypes here, what's the American dream? Become oh, a successful businessman? Be Wear the Donald Trump suit, make all the money, have all the power, create all the rules. And that's what this costume he's wearing is that he's being sacrificed in is the the suit and tie corporate CEO boss guy. And underneath that mask, it was just death. It was just (laughs) artificiality. And uh, it's completely different than the, yeah, it's just could not be more of an inversion from the Odin or the, the Jesus character, I guess. Truly. I mean, and it as symbolized too in the, in this original art here where he's got his, you know, his, his um, aura or his halo, right. Signifying that like, this is being done for the greater good uh, at some level, at least, uh, or, and, you know, for self enlightenment too, perhaps, but this guy over here is like, doesn't even have a face. Like he's not only not like got an aura is like most of his head is gone. <laughs> he's just got some sort of like metal, trappings around a skull absorbing into the collective kind of because your face is the one thing that makes you distinguishable over anything else i mean maybe tattoos or something but you're not born with that and nothing i was talking to somebody about this today but nothing lights up the human brain the way that facial recognition does it's one of the main functions of your brain if Hmm. functional mris that show what people's brains do when they look at the face of someone they recognize. It's crazy. Everything is light at that point. And it really, really upsets me that children in their developmental phase are not developing that part of their brain the same way because everyone around them is covering their face and being absorbed into the collective and sacrificing their individuality to the crowd for the safety of relinquishing their own responsibility to do the right thing, regardless of what the crowd does. Which is what the hanged man is about. The hanged man, Jesus does the right thing because it's the right thing. Despite what the crowd wanted. He had all the opportunities to sell out. And Odin knows Ragnarok is coming, but he fights the wolf anyway. You know? (laughs) And that's not... No one wants to fight a fight. Everyone is ready to be assimilated. I say everyone. I mean, you and me, a lot of the audience, no. But And just because you put a mask on your face doesn't mean I'm calling you a collectivist loser or whatever there, right. we all have circumstances that we're being forced to make sacrifices that we never would have wanted to make and that are not meaningful sacrifices like is there any meaning 
in the sacrifice of the hanged man on the right compared to the spiritual, deep spiritual meaning of the guy on the left, the right, right. it looks like he's just a lynching. There's no, there's nothing higher about it. Again, one where there's not a lot to look at in the card itself, but as you just think about what it means for it to be inverted, it really reflects the direction that we are going or have been going and have been in for a long time. Maybe we're not going to go this direction much longer. I don't want to like say that we're locked into that. Right. <laughs> a lot of us don't want to wear that suit and tie and be right. crucified by our own greed, essentially. And give up what for it, you know, because that's the, like you said, there's no meaningful sacrifice and it's the same, um, you know, now, like if there was a really uh, somehow great reason to rob your children of their development and their ability to have empathy uh, and sympathy, you know, and like emote correctly and receive emotion back correctly, uh, then maybe there would, maybe you could wear a mask and be fine, you know, but there isn't actually anything good true or noble that is being done with these uh mask wearing and so instead you're just sacrificing your child you know but like literally you're making a sociopath it's not going to be easy for these little beings to become well um balanced in that emotional arena without this input that they should have been getting this whole time from a million different places uh, and just like the corporate world, you know, it's the same. It's like, well, you're sacrificing, but are you doing it for like the best reason? Like, is, is it actually going to have been worth it to you in the end? Uh, wouldn't it maybe have been better to sacrifice like that extra trip to Haiti or uh, your like nice new car or something in order to spend more time with your children or something like that? Right. So it's that same sort of energy where you're like, yeah, sure, you're sacrificing. Go ahead and do it. But like, what are you sacrificing for? Mm. It flows on from the previous card, too, when you think about value systems and what is the corporate wage slave chasing IOU notes, actually. It's not even money. It's an yeah, IOU it you're passing mean around. Anything. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So <laughs> the hanged man on the left has a different value system than the one on the right. Yes. <laughs> I, I wanted to tell a quick story about to, I know that it's probably at this point burned out for people to be hearing about masks. but. Right when this all started, I saw a mom and a like four year old kid in a grocery store. And another older woman walks up to them and the little kid gets kind of startled and jumps behind his mom's legs and is like hiding. Yeah. I'm scared. And his mom's like, oh, that's just your grandma. You couldn't recognize her with her mask on. And that <gasps> heart was broken. I was just like, oh, my God. This is this is what you're teaching. <laughs> it's it's it is scary. I get why the kid was scared. It's a yeah. It's a hardwired into us from generations and generations that people that cover their face, um, in most cases, don't have a good reason to do it, a good intention yeah. behind it. And right. I know They're there's dangerous. exceptions to that, but the of course. Anyway, not to linger on that, but no, it's really sad. It's absolutely one of the poignant examples of how truly evil this is yeah I, it just all you have to do is feel it <laughs> and you go yeah. oh this doesn't feel right but well, okay <laughs> that's that's our main problem is we don't have connection and we don't have emotion <laughs> we have it like we've given it all up but we can we can do a whole episode just on that yeah and it uh, definitely <laughs> ties into to all this because oh boy Ooh, wow yeah, moving into death uh, death oh, is wow. the card of becoming it signifies an imminent and difficult transition, the conclusion of one phase of life and the beginning of another. Inevitably, something gets lost during the transformation, but something else will rise to take its place. That is an interesting take because it's like one of the, it's trying to tell you death is really good, <laughs> which death has its place in nature, but. Yeah. It's interesting because their nice little description is like, it is, it's a, it's a good way to look at it. It is a transition. You do give something up. You do get something new. Like these are all very pretty balanced ways to look at death actually. But that art is not reinforcing the feeling of the description or like, you know, the balance of the description. The art is really only about like the terror and the horror and the brutality and like the force of an like possibly untimely or unwarranted death like that guy is not like the nice like ferryman who comes to take you to the other side or whatever like that guy doesn't mean well as far as i can tell and he's got all those nasty wires coming out of the back of his head 
So not only is he, you know, the, the worst aspects of the worst type of death, but he's like deeply connected to the machine and like a, an agent of the machine rather than, you know, I love the death card in my deck because it's this very beautiful. Um, it's not like airy fairy beautiful. It's just a deeply beautiful, like somber look at this, um, you know, uh, phenomenon of death. And, it, and it's very, you know, natural sort of looking. And this is very unnatural and very brutal. <laughs> it's gross. I think he is fully machine, actually, looking at that. Yeah, I, don't see, right. I don't see any humanity in that. I don't see how you can convert a human to be all the way that. I mean, the spine of whatever it is is exposed. It's got a creepy tongue, Spiky. which is a callback to the lovers, first of all. Big right. call back to the lovers, the way that tongue looks, and those were skulls. Right. But to me, the most obvious interpretation here is that the machine is death. In a way. Yeah. Like if you put everything, break it all down to the yin and yang <laughs> constituents, then you have life and you have you have reality and artificiality. You have life, you have death. You have organics mm-hmm. and you have synthetics. Right? So on right. that yin and yang spectrum, the machine is death because Not that we can't use our own power to transmute and shed parts of ourselves for our own good. Like maybe it was a good move to adopt a certain machine type of capability, some technology at some point for human history. There's time and again, examples of when that was worth it to do it. But what did you give up? Whatever the natural world behavior you had before the machine that allowed you to do the same thing. That is what dies. So everything that we give to the machine to have it do for us, that part of ourself, we've killed eventually. I think that's a big part of what we can take away from the fact that instead of death being a skeleton, it's a robo skeleton, full on (laughs) robot machine. Yeah, I'm so glad you took it there. That is like my jam. I'm always trying to point out that like every single thing that we have machines do for us, there is something that we used to be able to do for ourselves that is now dead (laughs) and it's convenient and it's nice and it's cool. And it's like, exactly. What are we killing? What are we giving up? Um, It's like a slow process of humanity taking everything that was inside them and putting it outside them until the inside (laughs) is pure emptiness. And then it's like back. It's that uh, in through the outdoor, (laughs) maybe at that point when we're pure empty we've got nothing left of our natural self, then somehow that'll make us like Nephilim Godmen and we'll re- fix ourselves from there. I don't know. I think that's like the wet <laughs> dream of the transhumanism is right. to, uh, <laughs> like, I can't remember the guy, the crazy renegade rabbi, Jewish guy from back in the 1600s, I think who preached. I wish I could remember this dude's name. There's this crazy movement where this guy was like starting a whole Jewish cult around the concept that the way to get to God fastest is to do the things that are most depraved and most like defiling possible. Levi? Levi? Maybe that sounds right. (laughs) I don't know. People will know what I'm talking about if they do, if they don't, then they'll come across it when they need to. But it just reminds me of that concept too, that. Yeah. There's a, there's a Buddhist character that's similar too. He was like the Buddha. I don't remember which Buddha, but it was like the Buddha of defilement. And he'd just like shit himself and like laugh at people and like, you know, throw food. And just everybody was always like, oh my God, this guy, like, how is this a Buddha? But it's like this idea that like you, at least every once in a while, you need to remember like how we're just, just people. And, you know, we all have whatever, I don't know, like human qualities or something like that. I was like, eh, that's interesting. It has yeah. a role as an archetype that's positive, like the Hayoka of Native American tribes, which was uh, they would wear like the opposite gender's clothes. They'd kind of be a clown. They would break taboos on purpose. And it was all about yeah. to like, I think the whole point was as a function of the larger social organism was to show individual cells in the organism, which would be people in the tribe where they're leaking. Like this is where your ego has a a crack in it and I'm going to poke that crack and we're going to, yeah. And that's going to bring light out of it eventually, even if it pisses you off at first, but that was like an honored and respected role. But I don't think, I don't know. Maybe that's why the anal swabs are a thing. Maybe it's all mockery trying to get people to crack. I kind of, cause I'm like how I, you know, as we like push and push and push further and further towards this absolute, like you said, like extroversion and inversion (laughs) at the same time, I also see people in places where things are like 
bursting out like brighter than ever before, you know, and like people's even their inner worlds are getting deeper. And a lot of people are like we waking up not just to like how twisted things have sort of been, but to the fact and knowing the gnosis that they are these spiritual beings, you know, and that we actually have so much uh, that we're capable of uh, inside of us. Every one of us does. And so that it is sort of this um, equal and opposite reaction. Right. And so I, I have this hope that the further it's pushed, the more the sort of light will burst out of so many other places. But um, so, yeah, they're like, it's the same idea, right? There's always this role for the sort of trickster or the darkness or the, uh, person who can poke and mock and and whatever and um and this death is not that I, th- I think this death is just brutality and force and like the celebration of death for death's sake not for like the natural part of the cycle in which things have to sort of you know crumble down to dust in order to feed the seeds that will be the rebirth <laughs> that's interesting <laughs> that made me think that like the the guy you said brutality the death on the right there's no pleading with that death. Like the, on the no. left, they're talking to him. Like one guy's fainting, but there's uh, some princely guy, maybe like pleading in some way yeah. with death and death takes his time. He's riding a horse at a nice slow trot, holding his flag. Yeah. The death on the right is just pure cold calculating efficiency. It's the Terminator. Care at all. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it is the Terminator. It's Terminator. So that's a big difference. I think is that like in, <laughs> In the 5G completely fenced biosecurity future, yes, <laughs> where everything, everybody, everything's tracked, there will be walls that are completely invisible, but that now you can't cross. And there won't be a human being to ask whether or not they can make an exception for that. The machine is going to decide. I already run into this in, at, like, at jobs and, and work and things like that, where you have to deal with some process that happens automatically, no matter who you try to plead with it and it's just like there's no we're we're taking out the humanity of every interaction we possibly can while putting a middleman in there that also charges you electricity or money (laughs) for it we've mechanized bureaucracy like you used to not be able to plead with just bureaucratic processes but now you can plead even less (laughs) yeah like nope still bureaucracy but now you can't even talk to it (laughs) like bye-bye but uh, the last thing is just thinking about the transformation aspect of it. Uh, I'm not sure what I'm thinking here, but it's just interesting how on the, the left you can still have the sun going down between the two towers. That's kind of mirroring where it was at on the justice card. And again, where the, the uh, there's no sun, but there's this creepy light coming out of the thing's eyes, which is yellow, yeah. which is kind of like the... Infor- the negative enforcement of will in a way. Mm, yeah. Yeah. And the, you know, in the, in the left, you at least have like the river, you know, you're going to cross the river and there's this process to it. And it's like part of the process. And over here on the right, you're like, there's no, um, you know, even some of these gods and goddesses that it are the mythic correspondences it's pointing out. Like those are really representative of, again, like a process. This is all part of a continuation, you know, that uh, likely never ends and you have no, indication of that on the right it's just it's just something that's going to (laughs) happen there's no connection there's no like honoring of the next stage or you know even making sure you were at the right stage to begin with before your head was taken off or whatever is about to happen to people here right the uh flag that he's holding is the ocean every like you're returning to the ocean in a sense whenever your spirit leaves the body and you return to the whole pleroma of bioplasmic ether that is the consciousness and light of reality, the cosmos in the ocean. Everything is in there before we ever invented it. Every technology, every geometry, every shape, everything that humans could ever have imagined. There's something in the ocean somewhere that's got that bioluminescence or it's got that pattern. It's already there. (laughs) And we're seeing that like phi, um, Venusian five pointed design on the flag as well. That's just reminding us that, that's life. The The deep waters are where life emerges from. And when you go back under the water, so to speak, in the sleep of death, but you're then reformed by the primary archetype of life itself. And then yeah. on the right, it's like the only place you're going is oblivion. <laughs> there's, yeah. there's no ocean Insane. to return to. The ocean's data. And if you we didn't save you on a hard drive, then see you later. <laughs> Truly. <laughs> Let's jump forward. Yes. 
Oh my God. Temperance. Oh. The card of balance. This doesn't look like that. No. <laughs> It may rep- symbolize self-restraint or the gradual shift towards a more mature state of equilibrium. Temperance is associated with being in control of oneself as well as the desire to achieve inner peace. <laughs> yeah, I guess that's Again. why you shoot up with someone else's blood or whatever the heck he's doing. Seriously. Inner peace. Ugh. Wow. There is and- nothing in any way that I'm like, this isn't even the same card at all. They. I guess maybe it is. It's got the triangle and stuff, but they, they seem to try to like sort of mimic it. I guess the arms are in in absolute um, mirroring, you know, reverse, which we've seen in some of the other ones too. Although the arms aren't even natural or real either. Uh, and instead of, you know, standing in this um, pond or this ocean of, of whatever, whether it's dissolution or some emotional state or however you want to take this in the, in the card, uh, He's standing in what? The closest could be like a pile. It's not a pile of blood. It's a pile of a body. <laughs> Which would, I'm guessing, I mean, he's taking the blood out of it. So maybe that's the closest correlation we can get. Man. Wow. There's no wings. There's no halo. It's so dark. It is. It's maybe <laughs> one of the worst ones. The black triangle is from the lovers, too. They did the black triangle in that one. Oh, my God, they did. Good call. You have such a good memory. I rewatched that. It was such a fun conversation. I loved it. It really was. I really, again, if anyone out there hasn't seen it, go, go check it out. It's so good. Uh, and you can get it on either of our shows, right? We, I have it on Rogue Ways on YouTube, and then the second half is in rogue.locals.com, and you've got it on Interverse, and then the second half is in the plus section for subscribers, right? Yeah. So, okay, yeah. Here's, what I'm, here's what this is making me think. Mm-hmm. All right, where's the current largest biological laboratory on Earth? Where is it at? I don't know. It's inside all the people that are getting a gene therapy injection oh, that true. is being called the vaccine, which is actually gene therapy. It's not, it's not even in a vaccine. any way a vaccine. Yeah. So, Good point. I mean, there's all kinds of conspiracy theories out there about adrenochrome and blood drinking and all that. But this is to return to like where inversion is happening here. The temperance card, it's alchemy. It's yeah. exalting nature by... Mm-hmm like finding the way to make it flow properly in a way. And there's so much symbolism of that in the original card on the left. And it has right. Sagittarius is all about that. It's directness and effectiveness. And so that's what alchemy is seeking to do when exalting nature is to make nature more effective in its own way, which is the Jupiterian expansion element of Sagittarius. Uh, right. So, what I see is that on the right, the guy, instead of alchemizing with, with nature in like a spagyric way, yeah. the alchemy that he's doing is inside of somebody else. So he's, instead of making an internal thing external, he's not making an external thing internal, but internal to somebody else that's his victim. And then he's pro- taking the profits of that, so to speak. He's absorbing that. He's vamp- vampirizing uh, out of that process. and. <laughs> It it's is like you're wow, it's creepy. Yeah, you're so you're absolutely right. You're supposed to be transmuting your inner self and your inner world, and you're supposed to be crystallizing those aspects of yourself that are the most pure and the most true, and kind of like casting away everything else that isn't you, you know. And and in your inner process, it's the same in the sort of outer alchemical process as well, right? You're like, um, you're purifying down to this potency. Uh, and, and he's like, yeah, I ain't got time from that, but I'm going to take the best parts of this other being and I'm put that into me and like, I'll just take that shortcut. Um, which is exactly the opposite. It's exactly the opposite. And and we see another (laughs) instance of a helmet with just one red eye in the middle. Which you, which is like, it has, and it, which has got this correlation over to the strength. Actually, that reminds me, wasn't it on strength? I don't know, but I remember that there was this really awesome uh, explanation you had for the, you know, they had one of their eyes and then that third eye was lit up, but one of their eyes was gone. And you're talking about two thirds of God and 666. And I was like, holy (laughs) shit, (laughs) that was wild. I remember Um, that. But yeah, this is like that Cyclopean, like, yeah, sure. You might have some very mechanized shortcut again version of your like third eye open you can see more with it than like the human eye can see at the same time you've given up your human eyes and your humanity and i don't think what you're seeing more of is like the spiritual realm with that type of a third eye 
you know, whereas like in the alchemy card or the temperance card that it's, um, uh, it's balanced. It's got the Trinity of eyes. Isn't you know, virtual there. reality just an inversion of the astral realm? Yes. It's, and that's why I hate it. <laughs> it's definitely like, if there's anything that could convince me, or maybe there's a Yalda Bayoth, it's that virtual reality is becoming more and more <laughs> integrated into reality. And that's what, truly, the, the way that a mystic sees the overlay of reality with many new things coming through the filter because of their third eye aperture, this guy on the right is getting data and information. Maybe he knew to vampirize this person because he had some way of scanning with his, or he could get their data by whatever devices they carry through his uh, heads up display and his third eye thing. I mean, yeah, the third eye, the, the inversion of the third eye to me is the immersion into a virtual or augmented reality overlay. Which is what I'm always saying. People are like, why do you hate it so much? It's just like a game or it's just like a thing. And I'm like, dude, we, we already don't know how many layers deep we are. Why would you go deeper? <laughs> why would you go deeper? I'm good. I'm good at this layer of depth. I'm, I'm working my way out of it someday. So I don't want to go down further. But yeah. And then, you know, it, same in alchemy. You're going to like, um, you know, I don't want to say cast off because you can use all the parts, but in a way you're sort of like, once you've purified this down to its essence, you have like cast off a lot of what's no longer needed. Well, what's no longer needed in the inversion is like other life. You know, it's just like a lot of the other cards. It's just this like, put it back into yourself. Just be selfish. You're an enclosed system. Like you don't need anything else. Um, and maybe why you, you can do that with a human as the stand in for the entire natural world yeah. is because the human is the fractal microcosm yeah. of the world and like i've talked about pcr which blows my mind the idea that uh, carrie mullis the guy that invented that he talked about how it was like a transcendental thing that the w tiny blip of genetic or you know biological material you take from a person if you keep amplifying that and causing what's there to double and double and double if you do enough cycles of that eventually you'll find everything that the body contains which makes no sense because it was such a tiny sample that it should have only been like a little bit of this or that, but it's all in there. And I think Fractals about <laughs> all the way down. So with <laughs> this alchemical laboratory of all the people being experimented on right now with the gene therapy, it makes me wonder is the reason why they considered effective because that they won't show up with that MRNA in a PCR test. And if they've been, if they were actually able to remove part of the total expression of the human being that way, are they reducing the fractal by doing that to enough people reducing the express, the possible expression yeah. of humanity? Cause we have, no I mean, if you do look into it in German viral theory and terrain theory, you realize, Oh, we have no idea what the MRNA sequences that are called viruses really are other yeah. than it seems just as likely that they are originating in the body. And when you know about how polymerase chain reaction works and you actually Listen to the, what the obviously really intelligent Carrie Mullis said about it. Then it makes it, it definitely reflects that Buddhist idea that every drop contains the whole, which is why maybe this vampire can take anything he needs out of his victim as a stand in for nature, which would have been the original source of everything. Damn. Yeah, that's exactly it. That's exactly <laughs> it. But it's like so sad, too, because like the best. And the most beautiful aspect of the fractal is when you're like looking back up, right? And you're seeing that you can like go out and go further and expand more and like connect to even more things. And instead, like in his version, he's like, he's still the fractal. He's still a piece of it, right? Of the whole. And it's not gone yet, but he keeps going down further and further, like collapsing more and more. Yeah, reduction. I'm seeing a definite theme of the uh, reduction here. Yeah. Reduction of humanity, reduction of archetypes to one dimension. And alchemical reduction, which has a different connotation, not as negative, <laughs> but this right. is the inversion of that concept. Well, and that's what's it's like we said last time, or or you said at least that um, you know, they are they're brilliant in how they've done these because they've captured all of the essential uh elements and meanings and ideas, but perfectly inverted and reduced <laughs> and limited <laughs> and cut off. <laughs> and the last thing I'll say on the mythic level is that Athena or Minerva, goddess of wisdom. Definitely the inversion of the idea of wisdom is the blind belief in scientism, which is why we have this giant gene therapy 
laboratory in the public now with transhumanist push being experimented on. Yeah. So I'm going to throw it back to you and ask, what do you want to do? We got 55 minutes deep right now in hour one, maybe a little less than that. If you trim out like the first minute of getting ready, but let's do at least uh, one more before we do the transition cut off. Yeah. I'm up for it. We'll be loose with our time. We're good. Okay. (laughs) Ah! Wow. <laughs> wow. The devil is a secret card in the game. You don't find it unless you take really? a certain path that is the darkest, darkest path, path you can take. Yeah. <laughs> I knew you were going to say that. <laughs> <laughs> the devil is addiction, craving, and passion. Brings fame and fortune, but at the price of losing oneself to a world of material distractions. The devil lures unsuspecting souls into traps, but always grants them a choice. One can try their luck and take him up on his offer. But one should always know when to call quits. Vampirism theme continued. That looks like (laughs) something that's going to eat you for sure. Definitely got the spiky teeth. It's fascinating, all these eyes, because the devil, you know, when the devil comes up in a reading for me, I'm always emphasizing that this is um, this is your it's your temptation. It's maybe very sensual. It's maybe it doesn't even have to be sensual, though. It's just something that you really uh, desire and that you have the tendency and the pattern of like grasping after and running towards when you see it. And this is presenting an opportunity. So like they said in that description, which, again, they have some nice, correct truth in there. It just doesn't always match the energy of the card. But, um, you know, it does give you a choice. It gives you an option. And it's like any sort of um, good trickster is going to like throw the wrench into our wheels but then like by doing that we're like okay well i'm gonna make like barriers around my spokes so you can't get in there or whatever like i'm gonna learn from this that i'm gonna i'm gonna move on and so even as you deal with the deepest illusions that you have you know about which are are commonly tied hand in hand with your temptations as well uh that gives you this opportunity to purify that aspect of yourself right and to face this thing that is going to ask you like and tempt you and invite you down this path that you know is not the best choice for you and it's gonna it's going to reinforce the um positive option if you choose that instead so like you know the devil looks dark and scary and and whatever but it's actually offering us all of this growth and this opportunity if we take it that way and this (laughs) i guess the devil in their card is doing the same in a way except what you're being offered is the ability to like learn how to fight for your life and maybe your soul and like all those red eyes you know we know already they're like tapped into this like infinite database and and seeing like things that we can't even see but it's like that um it just reminds me of like this like mirror hall of mirrors you know like with all these eyes you're like reflecting all these different things at once and how much more of a an illusory trap that could be if you're able to have that effect added to the ultimate temptation you know that is your weakness being placed in front of you um yeah definitely a lot more of a trap than the opportunity energy in that card man it yeah, it is just one dimension of the archetype, which is the part about how it kills you. Yeah, it's the, <laughs> it's the dark road if you take it. <laughs> There's no semblance of how the chain around their necks of Adam and Eve on the left is loose enough that they could take it off. No semblance of right. that at all. I mean, I don't think that this thing on the right could take off whatever is attached to its head. It looks pretty no, integrated, it's like grown in, yeah, and. Uh, that's the most important thing about the the devil, so to speak, is that your addictions are what kills you, but that you could take the chains of those things off at any point Anytime. that you want. Yeah. And being r- ruled by Saturn, addiction fits that because it is it becomes your ruler. And Saturn is like, a, you know, authoritarian in a sense or a a boundary creator, but also empowers you if you create the boundaries yourself. It's the threshold gatekeeper for a reason it's testing you and one of the things that i really blow my mind with when i think about with addiction is that the word is add diction you're adding a story it's a story Uh. that is added overlaid on your story about yourself which is that i need Uh. this thing and i need it at a certain level of frequency 
I need it this many times a day or whatever. And there's so there you're trapped in a, a time construct that's unnatural An illusion. Yeah. But as the goat seed that Capricorn is, uh, that's what Capri and corn means. It is also a time of year that if you're wise about how you store and save your seed, metaphorically, it can apply to sexual energy. It can apply to like the literal uh, obvious saving of seeds to have something to plant the next year when you're eating through the stores that you so judici- judiciously prepared for yourself during Libra season. You want to keep track of those seeds they're the real currency just like the difficult aspect of addiction and the stories we tell about ourselves can eventually lead us to the true story about ourselves. whenever the difficulty helps us sprout and grow into a more complete and a more realized version of ourselves, which is what all the hard stories we tell ourselves are for all the addictions are there to help us tra- see that we can transcend that and that's why we put them in our own path. Uh, but <laughs> what a beautiful, what a beautiful window onto that. I love that addiction and the story that we tell ourselves. And you're absolutely right, right? And it's that same energy. Like you have the choice actually uh, to transcend that little pattern that you're going over and over and over and over and over. And when you're done, well, like you said, you get to look back and be like, oh, I'm actually a badass. Like I could actually do anything, you know, and including. And up to the ultimate challenge, which is, again, the devil's gift, so to speak, uh, is the, in trans, um, transcending your own senses, your own sensory, you know, sensual, uh, which is what any addiction comes down to, right? Even if the addiction is like, I like to like put lotion on because it feels nice on my skin, but I do it like 16 times a day because I actually became obsessed with it. Like, <laughs> you know, whatever that it's always sensory. It's like you like it puts the, feeling. the lotion on its skin. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Um, no, it's good. Yeah, that's like, the earth aspect of it. Yeah, and so you can you can actually be that powerful. Uh, so like these even these addictions are empowering in a way because when we transcend them, we learn there is no sense that we have uh, sight, smell, hearing, you know, any of it that can uh, trap us if we choose to be so structured and so committed that we um, transcend it. We can choose that, right? This is powerful, beautiful card, actually, I think. And when it comes up, I'm like, this is here's this opportunity. Like, let's smash through this. You know, you have that energy now that you can you can take you got the choice. Uh, But that's not what's going on in the other card. (laughs) Yeah, the card on the left is a more eternal dynamic as an archetype. We're always going to have that temptation element of addiction. But. And I, I mean, addiction just covers the gamut of everything that we do in society that is not helpful. We don't realize it, but it's actually like we have. I, I like to say demons are hypothetical because they work on if then conditional parameters and as far as how they control our mind or how programming in our mind works. It's always just like programming in a computer. You've inserted a, an addiction of if this, then that. Like, yes. And that's what keeps everybody running in the Saturnian Kronos hamster wheel, which is that, well, if I didn't have this job, I wouldn't be able to support myself. If I uh, took the leap into trying to homestead or something, I might run out of money and be screwed or whatever. There's a million things, but it's always like the thing that keeps you in the box is the if then statement. And it's also the thing that makes you even act in ways that are harmful to others too. And think that you need to vampirize them. (laughs) And what I think about the guy on the right is that eventually whatever circuitry is fueling that crazy evil eyeball smattering, it's going (laughs) to burn out. It's not eternal. It's not the eternal element of the archetype. Eventually it's going to die under the weight of its own artificiality. I mean, it's already basically dead. (laughs) Whatever that is, the spirit isn't probably present. So. It's just like um, think telling us it's just a waiting game. Like this really worst element of winter is going to subside and spring will come. Uh, no matter how scary that thing is, like it's not going to reproduce. It can't. It's not fertile. It doesn't have a seed to pass forward. It will eventually, you know, all created things see their end. But the uncreated, the unbegotten, humanity is part of 
the unbegotten. The I'm actually an anti-creationist. I, I realized the other day. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> uh, not because I don't think that all this stuff has an intelligent design to it, but because I've, I'm just I'm over the idea that there was some there was nothing and then there was something. The deeper I look into myself on an existential level and can and reckon with the void, the more it seems obvious to me that nothing can only exist with something to compare it to, and that that's it's a long story, but that's why emptiness or stillness is actually fullness and <laughs> you can yeah. sort of merge these concepts in your mind. And just, I like to just throw out that entire in the beginning, this, as far as how reality goes, I think it's more pertinent to look at ourselves as if we're part of nature, nature is eternity. It's self-evident self-begotten. Yes. It just exists self-existing. And we are that too. we, no matter how far back your memory goes, you know that there was something before that. You don't have a, any reckonable beginning, and neither should you assume that there's an ending for you. This and, is this is the exact concept of dependent arising in Buddhism. Yeah, that actually just came up with my last guest. We talked about. Oh, that. really? <laughs> yeah, there and I'm go. not I'm not against the concept on a linear looking at actual actions and reality in a slice of time but i don't think we necessarily need that concept as a big bang or as a god created this or that because there is there is no beginning and there's no end there is just there is something and therefore there is everything and nothing life exists the meaning of life is life that's where i'm at with it <laughs> absolutely i am with you well, and this, I just was thinking too, while you were describing that, how this um, character over here on the right, the devil version in that world is the epitome of like the reverse devil energy, which is all of these cards, actually, if you take the reversal of them and, and their inversion and epitomize it, like that's what it is. But I just like him as a character, he's there simply and purely responding to sensorial urges and programming and with no stricture and no structure or no choice to sort of possibly temper it or possibly go this direction instead or avoid like none of that, just pure response, pure indulgence, pure sensuality in like the darkest way possible. So it's very energetically perfect actually in the horrible way. Yeah. It looks like <laughs> the most reactionary monster you'd yes. ever meet. If it, right. it, it would react to even sniffing you by biting out your jugular. Yeah. <laughs> what a hor I'm going to take that off the screen. Yes, <laughs> it's let's horrible. Move on. But let me move over here. Let's do this since we are at that. That was the last card of part one of part two, however you want to call it. <laughs> yes. And I, I do want people to have a chance before we go into section two, which people will be able to get in rogue.locals.com and on Chances Interverse Plus section as well. Uh, so go, you know, support both of us uh, or, or, you know, whoever you already support in order to grab that access to that second part. It's going to be awesome. And the previous episode that we did. Uh, but I do want you to then share with people where they will go to get those things and to connect with you further. Yeah, interversepodcast.com has links to everywhere. <clears throat> Excuse me. Has links to everywhere that you can find the show. I'm on all the things that podcasts are on. And patreon.com forward slash interverse is where the plus extensions live. And that's the only place they're at, at least until maybe I set up a locals thing, because that sounds pretty cool. Definitely need to diversify the way people can access the show, especially in case something happened to it. But That'll wow. require a day of uploading all the archives to the other platform, maybe, and <laughs> not not a day. We're talking 100-plus episodes in the Plus yeah. archive since I started doing the extensions. And I hope to get a Rogue episode in the archive soon that's not just looking at the Cyber Tarot because uh, I'm sure we have plenty of interesting things that we can reflect about when we open up to each other's stories a little more. and. Really appreciate that we got to do this. I had a lot of fun with the last one, and this one's been just as mind-blowing. And it's amazing how quick we warm up into this flow state, and I appreciate resonating together. So thank you, and everybody, make sure you're supporting Lindsay because she's the real deal. 
<laughs> Thank you. Yes. And you too as well. I'm so excited to have found you and I hope people support both of us. So fellow travelers of the path, it is a beautiful thing. This has been your analog electric concentric dose of wisdom, according to the visionary chance garden of Interverse. chance. Thank you so much for being here and we will see everybody on the flip side.